When the word says, I was born this way, Jesus is saying, you must be born again. What are the topics which are rarely ever preached? Hell is rarely preached about. Sin is rarely preached about. And the new birth is rarely preached about. When was the last time you heard a sermon about the new birth? John 3 verses 5 to 8 Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which was born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Jesus said, You must be born again. This is something that everyone on earth must do. Why? The reason is that everyone born into this world is born into sin, and no one can escape the power of sin except if they go through what is called rebirth. I remember counseling a couple, and the husband would always get angry, and every time he got angry, he would lash out and start breaking things in the house, punching walls and so on. When I was counseling this man, I asked him why he can't control his anger, and he said to me, Pastor, I was born this way. Ever since I was a child, I have always had an issue with my anger. I was born this way. And now shortly after this, I spoke to another man who was in trouble with the law because he had assaulted someone. And I asked him why he did not walk away from the situation. And he said, I have always had a short fuse. And not only just myself, my whole family. My mother has a short fuse too. I was born this way. This is what I have come to see about human nature. We attempt to hide our sins behind a wall of silly justifications. The world says, I was born this way. Jesus is saying, you must be born again. Don't attempt to justify your sin by saying you were born this way. This is why the new birth is so important in the life of the believer. Some people fornicate, and they believe that they can't help it but fornicate because it is part of them. Some people commit adultery and they believe it is part of their lives. They were born that way. The truth is we were indeed born into sin. We were born into flesh and that is why all of these sinful acts are coming from the flesh. They are part of the flesh that man carries around. These things are indeed part of man, but that is not what Jesus wants to hear from you. When you see that you can't help but go into some sins, it is because you are still operating under the grip of the flesh. This is what Jesus wants us to do in our lives. He wants us to be born again. You can say many things about your life. You can say you were taught to tell lies and now it is part of your life. You can say that you were taught to fornicate and commit adultery and then you can't stop doing it. That is not what Jesus wants to hear. He is telling you to be born again. Enough of all these excuses that we give. We say many things just to justify our sinful actions. No matter the excuse you give for sinning, God doesn't listen to them. You cannot make excuses for sinning, and that is why you need to do the right thing now. Enough of saying that you were born with kleptomania. Enough of saying that you were born to tell lies. Enough of saying that you were born to look at the opposite sex lustfully. All of these things are the things of the flesh and now is the time to put them aside and do what Jesus is telling you to do. You must be born again. You must be born again. This life of sin must come to an end. Once you are born again, your life will change. You cannot be born again and remain the same way. You can't be indwelt by the Holy Spirit and remain the same. The sins you used to commit, you will find yourself not committing them anymore. And if you do commit those sins, there will be a godly sorrow in your life. 
Rather than loving and enjoying the sin and wallowing in it, living in it, you rather will hate the sin and ask for forgiveness for it. When you are born again, you will have a living, breathing, functioning relationship with God that will operate in your life on a daily basis, where you will go to school talking to Him. He will drive to work talking to Him. God will become the very heartbeat of your life. Sin won't be the heartbeat of your life, but God will be. Being born again is not just about attending church, because we all know you can attend church and be thinking about fornication. Being born again is being born of God, being born from above, where God becomes your father, where you as an individual start to make godly choices, where you as an individual will choose righteousness and holiness rather than fornication and adultery. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Are you going to continue giving excuses? Are you going to keep blaming how you were born? Are you going to keep saying the places you lived in made you sinful? Why don't you just give your life to Christ and be born again? The Bible says, Whoever is in Christ is a new creature and all things have passed away. The old things will be gone in your life and you will start living your life for Christ. This is when the works of the flesh would be put under. This is when you will start experiencing the power of God in you. You were born of the flesh, but it is time for you to be born of the Spirit. There is a clear difference between the flesh and the Spirit, and it is because of the things they manifest. The works of the flesh are listed in Galatians 5 verses 19 to 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. People who are not born again will find themselves doing these things because they are under the power of sin. They are being controlled by the flesh. The flesh will never leave you alone until you die. The power of the flesh will not let you be, except death comes, and that is why you have to kill the flesh. You need to die in Christ and be raised in Christ again. You need to bury the flesh. You need to let it go and become a new creature. This is what Jesus wants for you, and not the excuses you have been giving. This is the life that Jesus wants you to live. Are you going to start living it now? Are you going to run to Christ now? When you subject the flesh and you are born of the Spirit, you will start seeing the fruits of the Spirit coming out of you. You will see that you have changed. Your identity would have been changed. The life of sin that you cannot live without will be gone. Galatians 5 verses 22 to 24 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. These are the things Christ wants to start manifesting in our lives. When they are manifesting in us, it shows we belong to Christ, and Paul said, it means we have crucified the flesh with lust and affections. You cannot be born again and say you were born to tell lies. You cannot be born again and say that you were born to steal. Paul stated in Romans 6 verses 1 to 4 that, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? That grace may abound? God forbid. 
how shall we, that are dead to sin, live any longer therein? Know ye not, that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Why should you who claim to be born again go back into sin? Once you are dead to sin, once you have killed the flesh and you have been raised in Christ, you are a new creature. You have become a new child. Just like a new child is born into this world, you are born into the world of Christ. You are born into the kingdom of God and all you do is for the kingdom. If you are a new creature, the fruits of the Spirit are what should be showing in your life. Stop saying you can't help it but sin. Stop saying you have no control over it. It is not too late to come into Christ. It is not too late to crucify the flesh and become a new being. No matter how holy you try to be, no matter how prayerful you are, no matter the good things you have been doing, the truth is that this flesh will not get you into the kingdom of God. The flesh is full of sin. The flesh has no salvation in it. All the prayers will not make any change except you are born of the Spirit. The Bible says that what is born of the Spirit is Spirit. You must be born again. When the world says, I was born this way, Jesus is saying, you must be born again. Worry. Matthew 4, 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. God wrote this Bible for you. It is your guide. It is your manual. And God Almighty wrote it for you. And within this book, you will find instructions on how you should live your life. The Bible addresses a wide range of topics. And one of the topics the Bible addresses is the topic of worry. God, as our maker, knew that we as humans have a propensity to worry. And in his Bible, he instructed us on how we can overcome worry. Just do some research on the effects of worry and stress on the human body. You will quickly find that God did not design us to live in a constant state of stress and worry. Two words for you today. Don't worry. This is the message from Jesus today. Don't worry. But, but, Jesus, this is happening to me. Jesus is saying to you, don't worry. Matthew 6, 25 through to 34. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, 
and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Three times in this passage of Scripture, Jesus tells you don't worry. So, the next time worry attacks you, I want you to read Matthew 6, 25 through to 34, and you will hear the words of Jesus three times telling you, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. In this passage of Scripture, Jesus is not telling his followers to quit their jobs. Neither is he telling them to be lazy and expect God to supernaturally provide. Neither is he implying to people not to go to work to provide for their families. Neither is he telling people not to plan for the future. What he is telling you is don't be so consumed and obsessed with worry. So I ask you one simple question today. What are you worried about? What are you worried about if God said to you, I will never leave you nor forsake you? What are you worried about if God is in control? What are you worried about if God the Father is almighty and all-knowing? What are you worried about if God is always there in the time of trouble? This is a word straight from heaven today. God is with you, even in the crisis you are facing today. He is there with you now as you face the impossible odds. He is there with you now as you face the doctor's report. He is there with you as you face the giants in your life. I know, I know, I know, it looks hopeless. But the Bible is telling you, don't worry. What are you worrying about today? I just want to remind you that God is bigger than your worry. He is bigger than that situation. All that we are facing, the crisis, the sickness, the uncertainty in the world. God is bigger than all these things. It's okay not to be able to solve every situation in your life. It's okay not to have the solution. But know this, you have a God that has the perfect solution. Our God specializes in creating solutions for impossible situations. Philippians 4.6 says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. The Bible says that we should be careful for nothing. The word careful, according to that scripture, means we should take no thought for anything. The first reason we should not take thought or become worried about anything is that our worries will never make anything better. Rather, worries normally worsen people's conditions. This does not mean that we should be senseless or unthoughtful. We can make plans about the future and trust the grace of God to help us through the future. However, God does not want us to pierce our hearts with sorrows because of the challenges and cares of this life. There will always be reasons to worry, but we can also choose not to be worried. We are to be careful for nothing. Instead of being thoughtful and worried, we are to make our requests known to God with a heart full of thanksgiving. No matter how great our challenges present themselves before us, we must learn to magnify our trust in God above our problems. God did not say we should live in a little la-la land. We as Christians need to deal in the reality. And the reality is in every person's life, there are legitimate reasons to worry. For others, it is their children, others their job, others their relationship, others it is how they will pay the bills or how they will put food on the table. But what worry does, Worry limits your vision. Worry says everything ends with you and your resources. But that is not a reality for a child of God. So next time you worry, listen to the words of Jesus and don't worry. And hand that worry over to God.
Just give it to God. Present it over to Him. He is a loving Father. Don't hold on to that worry. Give the situation over to God and allow the peace of God to overflow you. Your resources are limited, but God's aren't. One of the greatest causes of worry is fear of the unknown and the fear of failing or losing. But Christ has already won the battle, and we cannot be defeated if we remain in Christ. We don't need to worry, because we are more than conquerors through Christ. Fear has been defeated. You are not a candidate of fear. You are not a child of fear and worry. God is your Father, and you are His child. God knows how the story ends. God knows what we need, even before we make our requests known to Him. He is a loving Father who cares for us. He values us and in His hand. Instead of being worried about what the future holds, we should rather seek the face of God, the God who holds the future. Can I tell you a secret? The problem you are stressing about and worrying about, God has already solved the problem. You just don't know it yet. Remember, He is a God that makes a way when there seems to be no way. Next time you are feeling worried, listen to the advice from Jesus in Matthew 6 and hear our Lord Jesus telling you in whatever situation you are facing, don't worry. Don't worry, don't worry, but this is happening to me. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. The beginning of sorrows are unfolding before our eyes. Matthew 24 verse 8 All these are the beginning of sorrows. In Matthew 24, after Jesus detailed the events that will characterize the last days, he concluded his summary with this statement, All these are the beginning of sorrows. The Greek word for sorrow is odinon, which is associated with labor or birth pains. What Jesus was talking about here is that the beginning of sorrows is what will happen before the great tribulation commences. If we look at Matthew 24, our Lord Jesus detailed a series of events that lead up to his second coming. Some of the things that happen in Matthew 24 occur before the rapture, which means that the church of our Lord Jesus Christ will still be here. But our Lord Jesus did not leave us with no advice, but he warned us. He warned us. He gave us instructions on how we can live in the age and times that we do. Matthew 24, verses 1 to 4. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered them and said, Take heed, that no man deceive you. Note that the first piece of advice Jesus gives us is, Take heed, take heed that no man deceives you. The New International Version of Matthew 24, verse 4, Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. I believe that if our Lord tells us to do something, we should do it. We ought to watch out. We ought to pay close attention that no one is misleading us or deceiving us. Jesus knew something that a lot of children of God don't know, and that is we live in an age of great deception. Everything is not what it appears to be. He said, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. He said, many will come, saying they are Christ. Jesus did not say one person will come. 
He said they will come in their numbers. These people will rise from all over the world. Jesus did not say they will come from a particular country, but they will come from different places. These people are already here. They are not even hiding anymore. They are showing themselves to be this. They are openly saying they are Christ. They openly say they are God himself. If you even search on YouTube, groups that believe a man is Jesus, you would be surprised at the amount of different groups that believe a human being is Jesus Christ. Jesus gave us a clear warning not to be deceived. The children of Israel have often been led astray by false prophets and false Christs. The rider on a white horse in Revelation 6 is the Antichrist, that final false Christ who will lead nations astray on a scale never seen before. He deceives the world on a scale never seen before. He will begin as a peacemaker, signing a covenant with Israel to protect her from her enemies. Jesus said, Watch out that no one deceives you. How can I ensure I am not deceived? Policemen who specialize in counterfeit money are primarily experts in real money. They understand real money so much so that when anything that isn't real comes across their desk, they pick up on it. They are able to recognize the finest details, understanding printing techniques and anti-counterfeiting mechanisms present in real notes. Anything that deviates from that standard is false. In other words, they know the real thing so well, they spot a fake from a mile away. And this is what you need to do with the Word of God. To protect yourself from deception and false Christ and false teachings, you and I must become experts in the true Word of God. When those truths are well planted in our hearts and minds, false teachings are easily identified and the enemy has no chance. Begin to know your Bible for yourself and protect yourself from the different ways of deception out there. The Word of God is not the church you attend. The Word of God is not the words of a man or a pastor. The Word of God is the Holy Bible. Because the truth be told, there are churches that started well, but have now deviated away from the path of Christ. There are churches that were founded on the principles of the Bible, but now those churches are slowly being conformed in the worldly idea of Christianity. Know your Bible for yourself. Protect yourself. Jesus warned you clearly to watch out that you are not deceived. And the way you can do this is by knowing the Word of God. Hosea 4 verse 6 My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. God's people are destroyed for a failure to know the Word of God. God's people are deceived for a failure of acquiring knowledge of the Word of God. So deception is one of the elements of the beginning of sorrows. Jesus continues to say, Matthew 24, verses 6 to 8, And ye shall hear wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Paul made the topic of the beginning of sorrow clearer by calling it perilous times. He even stated what will happen in 2 Timothy 3. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Look at the world today. Are these things not happening? Are these things not happening around you? You can see them around you, and that is to tell you that these perilous times are here. People are loving money more than anything else. I am not saying it just started in this age. I mean, the rate at which it happens in this age is alarming. 
People will do anything for clout. People will do anything to be noticed on social media. All these things are an indication that the beginning of sorrows and the perilous times have begun. But I want to remind you of one simple truth. One simple truth that you need to remember. This single piece of truth will give you peace that surpasses all understanding. Four simple words. God is in control. God is in control and he will be with you even during the beginning of sorrows. Whatever the situation may be these days, I am telling you today that God will not leave you to go into that fire alone. God will not let you go through that storm alone. He will always be with you, and that is a promise made by Him. If you have forgotten, I will remind you from the book of Isaiah 43 verse 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Who else can say a statement like this to you? People will let you down time and time again. Don't put your trust in a person. Put your trust in the God of heaven, the one whose eyes are on you. You are his child, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. God will be with you. In this harsh economy, God will be with you. In this harsh weather and natural disaster happening everywhere, God will be with you. These are the words of the Lord, and none of these will go unfulfilled, because His eyes will always be on you. If you were born again, you have nothing to be worried about, because Jesus Christ the Shepherd will always watch over you. John 10 verses 27 to 28 My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Jesus said, No man can pluck them out of his hands. Look, you are secured in Christ. The protection of Christ is on you, and he will never allow anything to take you out of his hands. He is always looking at you and giving you all you need. Proverbs 18 verse 10 says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, the righteous runneth into it, and is safe. Just look at these promises that God has made. He will be with you and protect you. He said he will not leave you. Deuteronomy 31 verse 6 Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee. God will go with you, and he will be with you too. Just focus on the promises of God in your life. Listen to this and stop worrying. You need to stop worrying. You are precious in his sight. You are a rare gem in the eyes of God, and he will keep you at all times. Matthew 6 verse 26 says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Although the beginning of sorrows have begun, you don't have to live a life of fear. The Bible is a book full of warnings and instructions. And each and every one of the warnings and instructions in this book is written for our own benefit. One of the chapters in the Bible which is full of instructions and warnings is Matthew 24. Our Lord Jesus Christ in this passage literally gives you and me advice on how we can live in the last days. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus himself has given you advice on how you can navigate in this world you live in. So the title of this message is simple. Advice from Jesus on how to live in the last days. My sermon today will have four points. Point number one, don't be discouraged. Matthew 24, 6 through 8. 
and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. Jesus made it clear that all of these will be part of the last days, the perilous times. You need to focus on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. The truth is that all of these things will make life hard. They will make you want to give up. You are constantly hearing rumors of wars. You are constantly hearing about people dying and you don't know what to do. You feel like you are not safe. You feel like you cannot take these evils in the world anymore. Jesus said you should not be discouraged because of this. He said you should not be troubled. No matter what happens in this world, no matter what the government does in the country you live in, don't be discouraged. Don't live in fear. Remember that God is still on his throne. God is with you. I believe that if we all look back on the last 18 months of our lives and we can all testify to the fact that God was with us every step of the way. Isaiah 43.1 But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, Fear not, I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. Isn't that wonderful? God is your creator, he is the former, he is your redeemer. That's wonderful. God says, you are mine. How does that make you feel to know that God says, you are mine? You are not the devils. You are not the governments. You are not a random social security number. No, my friend, God said, you are mine. You are his. Look at verse 2, Isaiah 43, 1. When thou passeth through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Wow. When thou passeth through the waters, I will be with thee. He said he will be with you. He won't send an angel or a care package or another human. God himself will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. Have you been through the rivers of life? Have you been through the fires of life? Do you know who was with you? God. So when you see the beginning of sorrows in Matthew 24, 6 through 8, don't be troubled. God is still on his throne and God is still with you. Let Jesus order your steps in these last days. Point number two, do not be defeated. Matthew 24, 12 through 13, KJV. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You cannot allow yourself to be defeated in these last days. You cannot allow false prophets to lure you. You cannot allow sin to overcome you. You need to stay strong in this age. You need to grow strong and become strong in the Lord. You are not allowed to be defeated as a child of God. The reason why many Christians are not focused or remain in Christ is that they don't know what God has for them after this life. They don't think about the blessings that have been stored in heaven for them. This world is temporary. This world will fade and will never remain. You cannot live forever in this world. You are not immortal in this flesh. Don't allow the lust of the flesh to overcome you. Don't allow sin to overcome you. Don't allow the devil to overcome you. You have the strength of God in you. You need to remain strong in the Lord. Revelation 3.21 To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. You need to overcome all the challenges. You need to overcome all the problems. You need to overcome all the temptations. Point number three. Don't be deceived. Whether you like it or not, you live in an age of great deception. The God of this world is a God of deception. He is the father of lies. Deception is in his DNA. Matthew 24, 2 KJV. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Do not let anyone deceive you. Each time I read this verse, the words take heed always capture my attention. 
The words take heed actually mean to pay attention or look intently into something. In other words, our Lord Jesus is telling us to pay close attention. Pay close attention to what? To ensure that no man deceive. I have said it once and I will say it again. One of the worst things about deception and one of the most dangerous things about deception is that the people who are being deceived don't know they are being deceived. And our Lord Jesus is telling us to pay attention, to be on the lookout, to make sure that no man or woman will deceive you. Many people have gone away from the body of Christ because they allowed themselves to be deceived. Many are now in the synagogue of the devil because they believed what someone told them and not what God told them. This is exactly what the Bible said would happen. Look at this verse that speaks about the last days. 1 Timothy 4.1 Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Don't be surprised when you see people following strange doctrines. The Bible told us this would happen. Don't be shocked. Don't be perplexed. Believe what the Bible says. Many shall depart from the faith. This is why you see churches that openly encourage adultery and fornication. Churches that openly encourage sexual immorality. Churches that openly discredit the Bible. Don't be shocked. Don't be surprised. The Bible told us this would happen. People will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. As a child of God, you need to protect yourself because the thing about deception is that most of the time a person who is being deceived does not even know they are being deceived. They think they are doing the right thing. They genuinely believe they are doing the right thing. Jesus warned us about deception multiple times. Matthew 24, 5 For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. What Jesus is telling us is that in the last days people will make grandiose claims of who they are and what they can do. People will make grandiose claims and promises. People will even claim to be Jesus himself. People will claim, if you give this amount of money, you will be healed. And people will fall for it. The number one way you can protect yourself from deception is for you to get to know your Bible for yourself. Get to know the Bible for yourself. That way, when anyone moves away from what this Bible says, you can pick up on it. You can identify it. Don't be rooted in a church, because the truth is there are churches that started well but over time, as they grew, they watered down the gospel. Don't be rooted in a person, because people change. Be rooted in the Word of God, the unchanging Word of God. People can change, churches can change, but do you know what doesn't? The Word of God. Isaiah 8:20, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. If there is disagreement between God's word and the word of the messenger, it isn't hard to figure out who is wrong. The messenger is wrong. The word judges the messenger. The messenger doesn't judge the word. 4. Don't be doubtful. Matthew 24, 34 through 35, KJV. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things are fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. There is something that pleases God more, and that is called faith. When you have faith in God, it means you also have faith in His words. That means you believe in God, but if you allow doubt in you, you will destroy the faith you have in God, and God will not be pleased with you because it means you don't believe in Him. God is saying that He will make things new for you. Do you believe that word, or are you doubting it? Jesus said he will go and prepare a place for you in heaven. Do you believe, or are you doubting these words? This world will fade. Everything will be gone, but the word of the Lord is something that can never go unfulfilled. All these things that we have been told about the last days are not just fictions or ordinary guesswork. They are things that will happen, and if they don't happen, the word of Christ will remain and will never fade until it happens. The word of God will remain. That is what you should hold on to. That is what you should base everything about your life on. The Word of God is great, perfect, and accurate. Don't be doubtful. A perfect example of this is the rapture. So many Christians have become more and more doubtful about the rapture. 
They have listened to people who say people have been preaching about the rapture for decades and it has not happened yet. A man once said to me, I heard the rapture being preached about 40 years ago and it still hasn't happened yet. Brothers and sisters, we need to remind ourselves that God does not operate on our timetable. We need to humble ourselves. God does not operate on our human scale. The events on God's prophetic calendar will take place when the appointed time comes. Do not be distracted. Distraction is one thing that can make you miss out on the peace that Jesus will give. Many things can distract us in this world. There are things the devil is bringing every day to make us go away from Christ. Not that these things are not working because people have gone away from Christ already, but we need to make sure we focus on one thing, and that is Christ. The Bible says in Matthew 24, 42 KJV that, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. The most important word here is watch. Stay focused. Don't be distracted by anything. Focus on the race set before you. You are meant to stay alert and remind ourselves that Lord Jesus will return at any time. Hebrews 12, 1 KJV Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about what with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Praying in your closet. Matthew 6, verses 5 and 6. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. One thing we should all know is that the most important thing that we should know is that God doesn't like hypocrites. If you want to pray, your mind is important to God, as God searches the mind. Your intentions are important to God. If you want to pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. Jesus highlights what we should consider when we pray. Those looking to announce their own spirituality loved to pray out loud and loudly both on the street and in the synagogue. While this might not be as common in the modern era, it is still possible to pray with an inappropriate concern for how we look or sound to other people. As with selfishly motivated charity, Jesus says those who pray for show have received all the reward they're going to get. The Father will not honor acts of spiritual pride disguised as acts of righteousness. Even in prayer, one cannot do good for the wrong reasons. There is a time and place for praying with other believers, but our prayer life is meant to be in the prayer closet, or as this passage says, in your inner room. So I ask you today, what is the motive for the things you do? In our day, just like in Jesus' day, there are people who do good religious activities just because they want to look good in front of other people. They want to be seen and admired for their righteousness. How can I impress my neighbors or friends? How can I show off to my church congregation? How can I be recognized as Captain Super Saint? Go to church, give to the poor, say my prayers? Jesus says that if you're involved in a lot of religious activity just to impress people, then it doesn't mean anything to God. It's just not what it's about. If your motive for going to church or doing some good deed or helping the poor or praying to God or performing some religious duty, if you're doing those things to gain the admiration of the people around you, then it doesn't mean anything to God. What Jesus was talking about is you and I not behaving like hypocrites. Don't pray just because you want people to see that you know how to pray or to show that you're a Christian. We can pray anywhere we find ourselves as long as our motives are pure, but the truth is the best place for you to pray conveniently is in your house. Sometimes you need to calm down and talk deep with God. There are some prayers you cannot pray while at work. There are some prayers you cannot pray while walking on the street, even if you have a good motive for praying. 
There are some prayers you need to go into your closet to pray with fervently. There are times you need to fight wars in your closet. There are times you need to lock yourself in a place and start firing prayers into the world, into your world, into the lives of others. You need to have a place of your own where it is called your battleground. That place should be in your house. We as Christians must know how to create a place for ourselves. We must know how to shift ourselves against the world and pray serious prayers. We must know how to close the door and never think about what's outside, but keep praying with fire in us. In this age we are in, any Christian that is not fervent with prayer might be a casualty of this wicked world. Any Christian that does not know how to pray becomes prey for the devil. This is not the time to be thinking about building a prayer life. It is time to build one. Now look at verse 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. From this verse, we see four clear lessons from Jesus. The first lesson is when you pray. Jesus did not say, if you pray, he said, when. Prayer is not an option thing for us believers. It is a command. Paul closes his first letter to the Thessalonian church with a list of things they need to remember to do. We must also remember to do these things. On the list of things written by Paul, there is a very small verse. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17. Pray without ceasing. Prayer is a command and it is not an option. Prayer is the method every child of God fights with. The most influential person in the world isn't a president, a queen, a king, or a celebrity. The most influential person in the world is a person who knows how to get their prayers answered. This is the right time to quit superficial Christianity. This is the time to start praying and fight for yourself, your marriage, your family, and the world. This is the time for people to know that there are people called the children of God. Look at your life. Look around you. Watch the news. Do you like anything you see? Do you like how the evil ones are taking over the world? You need to wake up now and start fighting. You need to start fighting. God has called you to be the light of the world. Create your war room and fight. The world needs you. Your family needs you. The neighbors need you. Don't say that you don't know them. You must learn to fight for yourself and others. Pray for people just as you will pray for yourself. If you have not been praying for yourself, it is time to start. It is time for you to become a fire that burns the enemies. Every time you pray, every demon within a mile radius needs to run. Stop allowing the devil to influence your life and dictate what goes on in your life. I'm not okay with the way the world is going. I'm not okay with the way evil is growing and growing in the lives of people. Evil is now creeping into churches and we are not seeing it. You should not be okay with it also. You should fight with the power of God. It doesn't matter how deep your closet is. It doesn't matter where your closet is. Jesus said God will see you there and he will answer your prayers. Pray in the secret and let the world see the manifestation in the open. The second lesson is, go into your inner room, close the door. We have been given a location for our prayers. Don't stand on the rooftops and shout with your prayer. Go to a secret place. That may be a closet in a room. It may mean you need to drive off by the park on the riverside to spend time with God. Husbands and wives, yes, pray together, but there does need to be a time where you even seek God for yourself talking to your Lord in the morning or even at night. True prayer warriors are not those who know how to pray for themselves. They are those who know how to pray for themselves and the world. Are you ready to become that person that God wants you to become? Are you ready to create a war room for yourself? Are you ready to tackle every power that is against you and your progress? Are you ready to fight and save your life and marriage? 
Are you ready to fight to save your business? Do you think the evil ones are happy you are making progress? Do you think they don't wish evil upon your life? Let me be the first to break this to you. The world is an evil, evil world. There are people who are watching and plotting and waiting for your downfall. This is the time for you to go into your closet, go into your secret place and fight on your knees. You need to create a war room now. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't grow weak. Have the power in you. The third lesson is your father is in secret and sees what is done in secret. Why is it that Christians sometimes have more faith in God when they do negative things? For instance, if a Christian commits a secret sin, they will feel so guilty and they will have full confidence in the fact that God saw them commit that sin. But when it comes to praying, they doubt whether or not God saw them pray in secret. God sees what is done in secret. This brings me to my final point. He will reward you. Don't you want a reward from God? Hebrews 11 verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God is in the business of rewarding those who seek him. Don't you want a reward from God? I am simply here to encourage you. Pray always and don't faint. The world needs you and God wants you to be the light that shines in the world. That is what you have been called to do. Luke 18, verse 1. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. God bless you.